So welcome everyone to the Ice House podcast number 11. My name is Maurice and I am one of the customer growth partners here at the Ice House. So my role is to talk to business owners and senior leaders about their business and about their roles in the business and to provide solutions um, through the Ice House for them. So with me today, I have got two lovely gentlemen. You'll probably see that they've got um, the same surname. <laughs> we've got Carl and we've got Greg from Kitchen Mania. Welcome, Carl. Welcome, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. So, um, how do you two know each other? <laughs> Known each other for quite a while, actually. I was waiting. I was waiting for Carl to say he's my younger brother or yeah. older brother or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I first you missed, you missed that one, Carl. You missed yeah, that I one. Did, mate. I was just going to say I first saw the back of his head forty years ago, and there's not much more hair there now than there was then. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you can you can you can feel the love on this yeah. call right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so, no, no. Um, so, Carl's an Ice House owner manager alumni number forty three, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And Greg also did one of our uh, finance workshops. Was it last year? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So, um, before we get into a little bit more about the Ice House, um, it'd be good to um, let the audience know what the history is of Kitchen Mania. So. I'm not sure who wants to take the lead on this. Maybe you, Carl? Yeah, I'll start on that. So, um, so Kitchen Mania was established in 2009, um, right in the middle of the GFC. So um, crazy sort of crazy time to start a kitchen company. And um, in actual fact, Jumbi Port, that's where the name Mania came around. And um, we sort of go a little bit crazy and a little bit maniac. And a guy, a friend of mine asked me what I was going to do. I'd just finished um, working with a previous company that I'd established for and been working with for 20 odd years. And I told him we were set up, starting a kitchen company he called me a maniac. And um, so that's where the kitchen mania came from. But basically I'd been in, an industry, been in the industry as a supplier to the industry and woodworking machinery for 20 odd years. Um, and in the end, worked with a company, an Italian company, uh, finished up with them, and I could see a, a gap in the market. The market had changed in the kitchen industry quite quite a lot in that in the, um, what we call the big box retailers had, had entered the market. They were placemakers, Bunnings, and might have 10. Um, and they were starting to really get some foothold into the market, and most of the kitchen industry... And it's a generalized statement, I know, but most of the kitchen industry saw that as a threat, uh, saw it as that they couldn't compete with the, with the likes of Bunnings and Mitre 10 with, with their marketing budgets and, and their supply chains and all that sort of stuff. And so a lot of the industry went away from sort of a mass production or, or, or what we call a, a, a system um, 32 construction where you've got standard cabinets and whatever and saw the only way that they could survive was becoming very bespoke um, and, and which was which worked for for a number of companies um, but i could see that the really the future and growth was was going to be around piggybacking on the back of the likes of mitre 10 and bunnings and all their advertising and all that sort of stuff but doing something a little bit more clever um, and in those days it was very difficult for a, a standard modular type kitchen to go to the to go to the ceiling and I designed a, a stackable cabinet basically that you could easily we could do different heights so um, I thought this was a great idea to take to market um, I, I don't know why I thought it was a great idea in 2009 because it was bloody hard but um, but we it was a great and looking at that it was a great time to start you know there was no market we we took on a big lease with a building bought machinery uh, hadn't sold one kitchen but the opportunities were great the marketing opportunities were cheap um, I guess you know, the, the buzz that we were able to, to create um, w was easy to be done because the competition had more or less just closed doors or folded up. So we started off making kitchens. I'd never made a kitchen in my life before. Um, I, we employed a couple of people that had. Um, that all worked for a little while. Um, but uh, we got off selling them and, um, and we've sort of we've grown from there. And um, it's been quite a success story, really, right up to now. So we're uh, now 11 years old and um, celebrated 10 years last year, and and um, had an average growth of just over 25 year year on year, 25% year on year since 2009. So 
Um, so I joined a year after the um, the the opening day for Kitchen Mania. So I was um I was actually in England at the time um, that Dad started Kitchen Mania and um, playing a bit of cricket and had a um, small company over there um, that I was running with my wife. And um, Carl called me up and he said, "Geez." this thing's bloody hard work, um, but painted this awesome picture about this exciting uh, new company that had been created and all the opportunities and um, sounded pretty good. And um, we, we were always sort of wanting to come back to New Zealand anyway um, and raise the kids and all that sort of thing. So um, yeah, we, we, we sort of ended our, I guess our period of time over in the UK about a year earlier um, than we were planning and uh, flew back and, Got stuck in, got issued my yellow polo shirt on uh, on, on the first day and pretty much, uh, yeah, lost the yellow polo shirt, but yeah, the blood's pretty yellow now, so <laughs> it's all good fun. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And is, he, is there anyone else in the family working at Kitchen Mania? Yeah, um, so... Kathy, mum, um, she she helps out with, um, she's, she's had various roles um, through the 11 years, um, but now works on um, taking minutes at our, at our monthly meetings, um, looking after uniforms, and looking after the cleaners, making sure cleaners are doing a good job in the, in the showrooms, and generally if there's anything that ever needs doing that we don't have someone to fill that gap, then, then mum does that, which is awesome. Um, my brother, um, Chris, who was a policeman, but he's now um, decided that he uh, quite quite thought the idea of working at Kitchen Mania was pretty exciting. So he's in our sales team and does an awesome job um, in that role. And my sister, Laura, um, who was a forensic scientist, um, but has now um, upskilled or cross-skilled herself to become our uh, marketing person. Um, so she does all our uh, marketing and um, posters and branding and all that sort of thing. So it's definitely a um, a real family affair, um, but that makes it makes it heaps of fun as well. Oh, that is absolutely fantastic. Have I um, forgotten anyone, Dad? Uh, no, the last one was probably the, the, the youngest daughter is probably the scary one, so we might keep her out of the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scary intelligent. Yeah. Righto, on to the next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, this year has been a bit challenging. It's It's been different. Um, Greg, I had the opportunity to listen to you at a, at a recent event um, held by Lava Box. But just before the second Auckland lockdown. Um, mm. But if we take our minds back to February, uh, when things started to change around the world, and then all of a sudden things happened for the worse in New Zealand, you know, what were you made at you know, what were your immediate thoughts and, you know, what was going on in your head when uh, the New Zealand government decided to say, look, you know, we need to be in lockdown, we need to stamp this out? Yeah, um, I guess the immediate thoughts were like, holy, holy something. <laughs> um, but um, also realised that it was quite important to try and um, come across in a calm, sort of thought out, balanced way for the rest of the team. Um, knowing that everyone was going through different emotions, um, I sort of thought if you can be as well planned and as calm as possible, then hopefully that that becomes the, the sort of, um, I guess, safe go-to if people have questions or uncertainties or anything like that. Um, so sort of once that was underway, or out of the way and, and um, under control, the next thing was um, we were just, we were in a period of real busyness um, just prior to the lockdown. And so um, we were installing quite a few kitchens each day. And with kitchens, if you're having a stone bench top um, you have the cabinets installed and then there's like a five to ten day wait period before the, the bench top can be fabricated and installed. So we had like probably around 25 customers um, out in and around Auckland that had cabinets um, in their homes, but they didn't have any bench tops. And so the thought and the scariness of going into a four to six to eight to whatever week lockdown we were heading into um, without having a kitchen, without having a bench top, with having kids and all that sort of stuff was um, was probably our first, um, or was our first worry and concern. And so it was quite cool though, in the, in the two days of level three, um, literally the whole team pulled together and we had, um, I think I mentioned um, last time um, we spoke, um, we had the accounts, well, the, the purchasing officer driving down to Hastings to pick up temporary sinks. We had the technical team guys, um, in, their, in their rough clothes, delivering um, temporary tops all around Auckland. 
Um, it was crazy, but somehow really, really cool at the same time. There was like a, a bonding and everyone was prepared to put their hand up to, to see what they could do to help out. And it, it really felt quite, um, felt like a real team sort of environment and a real cool feeling. So yeah, that was, was the first couple of steps in the first couple of days. Um, then we went through a real scary time and, and sort of um, customers um, calling and, and being really uncertain about their jobs and their families and um, the deposits that they've paid on kitchens and all that sort of thing. So there was a good couple of weeks of um, a lot of conversations with customers to reassure them um, as of our plans and, and, and that their money was safe with us and that we would still, um, when, when we're out of the lockdown, be able to um, sort of complete the orders. So um, it was a it was a pretty crazy time. And, and top of that, in terms of um, my situation, um, my wife also has quite a um, quite a um, time consuming job, and we've got three kids as well that were all um, learning how to um, learn online. So it was a pretty pretty exciting period, um, pretty full on. But it's um, I think made the year go pretty quick, right? <laughs> Oh, I tell you, it's September now. Yeah, oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, what about you? What was going on in your head? Yeah, well, it was interesting Interesting for me um, because obviously the, the two sides of the business, one was the immediate um, you know, customer, looking after the customer and the staff and 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 supplies, all that sort of thing, um, which which really I just gave to Greg or didn't. <laughs> he was doing a good job on all that. He just took all that and, uh, and ran with that. And I guess the other side of the company is is the is looking at the at the implications of of zero money coming into the into the bank account for for the next four weeks and uh, and how how could we you know yeah, there were things like um, um, lease agreements so I had to go negotiating with with, uh, with the landlords um, working with the accountants understanding trying to get an understanding around the wages for the staff how the COVID subsidy worked in. Um, so I had a lot of those technical things going on that I that I had to really get in and look after while Greg was looking after, I guess, you, you, you know, the, more the practical side of, of things. Um, and again, it was quite interesting because it literally t probably took the best part of two weeks to get through that period, um, you know, with lease negotiations and staffing and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then uh, once we sort of got on top of that and all that was right, then the following week, couple of weeks, it was more about working with Greg as to how we were going to work once we come out of it in level three and then level two, uh, putting all the protocols together as far as install installations, working with staff, the factory, all those sort of things. So we spent the next two weeks sort of working on all the protocols of starting the business back up again. So literally it's sort of the four weeks just disappeared in a hurry. Um, so yeah, it, um, the other thing was that that you know we knew that we had we had a good pipeline already in the sales in the sales team. We didn't want that to die, um, but we also saw opportunities as 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 I guess it did nine uh, eleven years ago. And that um, an interesting thing is on the Monday, so that we went into lockdown. I think it was a Wednesday. On the Monday, um, I had a phone call from both. Our, um, people we deal with with radio stations, um, both wanting to know if I wanted to readjust our radio advertising for that month. And one mentioned to me that she just got off the phone to most of her customers who were cancelling. She actually asked, she, the first question was, oh, I suppose you want to cancel this month as well, do you? Um, the great thing for me was that obviously they would have then had a lot of cheap advertising to spend. And so I said, well, no, not really, but it sounds like you've got lots of spare spots. Um, what deals are we going to do and how are we going to get there? And, and so we put together a big marketing campaign around radio um, that, again, was just like it was in 2009, dead cheap. Um, Facebook advertising got Greg to, um, to do a video of how to measure your kitchen from his home. Um, got all that online, changed, our, changed our, um, our website so that people could click on and go to how, how, how to get your kitchen designed while you're sitting in in lockdown and it really worked well and um, I guess for the sales team it kept them busy so they were doing zoom designs and what have you but of course with kitchens to actually get the person across the line in a lot of cases in 90% of the cases you really got to get them back to a showroom show them the product let them feel in touch and open drawers and and see what they're actually paying for and what they're what they um, you know the results that they're going to get before they will sign the order which which is very nice so we're, so our pipelines grew and grew and grew, um, 
we then came out of COVID um, in May and literally the, it was like I said, I don't want to use the word, but tsunami, it just hit us. And our um, sales for May were double our previous record sales month. Um, and yeah, so it was great. And so then we really, May, June, July was has just been manic. And um, and then it, along comes this uh, this latest little challenge. So, so yeah, but it's been good, and I, and I think it worked well between Greg and I. It was defined. We had defined processes that defined things that we needed to look after and make sure we were right. Um, and we were able just to have a catch up each day, and, and yeah, we it actually went quite well. It's mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways it, it bonded a lot of the staff. Um, you know, we had Friday night Zoom sessions and things like that. The staff were really on board, and, and um, there was a lot of good positives that came out for us as a business. Um, we have we're quite a bit up on this on the same time as what we were in the last financial year. Mm. And good for us. Yeah, no, that's absolutely amazing. And do you think it's because you went against uh, what everyone else was doing, and everyone was going, "Well, no, let's let's just stop. Um, we won't spend any, any money." Let's just focus on what happens after lockdown. Like what, what you know, what do you think was, was the was the light bulb moment for you guys? Yeah, I think for sure that that certainly had a big part of it. Um, but again, um, and so doing the extra marketing and the, that we did, the, the greatest thing about that is that is all the marketing that we did during that April period was quite low cost marketing. So so our spend wasn't too much. Um, obviously, the, the, the wage subsidy as far as expenses and all the rest of it certainly helps um, our business as it helped most businesses. Um, um, but we still didn't know, even though there was that whole, you know, people had done a lot of work with a lot of new customers on virtual Zoom and, and virtual design of whether or not that would transfer through to orders um, and sales or whether or not it was literally people. And we were quite open that if, if you were sitting at home and you wanted us to design your kitchen, then we'll design it for you and send you some 3D pictures. We didn't say you need to buy it before you get the 3D. So, so we we're also aware that there could be quite a lot of people that would just be using that as a real fun service or something to do while they're in lockdown. Um, um, so we didn't know how it was going to trans transform at the end of the lockdown. Uh, so we also decided in May to do a bit of a, a one-off promotion, which was which was a free GST month of May, as and we advertised it as a um, as a way of, of of everybody that's been in lockdown to to reward themselves and and what have you. And whether or not that and it was a genuine one, um, you know that that we spoke to suppliers about about our promotion that we we're going to do, and and therefore and and we managed to negotiate some better rates on some on our key key. Um, um, products that we're using um, and so we went to market with it free GST and it literally just it was just amazing and and, and um, I don't know the exact figures but but from what I, what I understand from the sales people and the pipelines and sales force uh, we converted nearly 90% of those jobs that we were virtually doing during lockdown uh, so that was true. that's an amazing testament <laughs> that's just brilliant and um, and was there anything that you implemented sooner um, rather than it being you know maybe next year or the year after in, into your, into your business? Yeah, um, well, uh, one of the things that were stood out for me was um, we have this um, sort of quite archaic folder, um, cardboard folder that holds all the different pieces of paper um, for a job, mm -hmm. um, and so the salespeople add to it, and then the technical people add to it and then the installers everyone's adding their, their little bit to this folder and it it ends up at the end of the process looking like it's sort of been through the wash and the dogs had a go at it and everything but um that that was impossible to get that folder around houses um during the, the different sort of departments and different stages of people's jobs um during lockdown and so really really quickly we had to uh, totally go away from that model and we had to put it all online and so quite fortunately, probably 18 months ago, uh, 12 months ago, um, we implemented uh, more of a cloud-based uh, system for our, for our software and, and software platforms. Um, and that allowed us to connect remotely from home with no glitches, no holdups, no anything. Um, and sort of the idea of being paperless was a bit of a pipe dream of a 12 to 24 month um, sort of plan for me but um, that was able to be implemented like in three days because it had to be 
um, everyone was on board. There was no other options, um, and, and people picked it up and ran with it, and it and it and it worked really, really well. So, um, I know we were looking at the number of um, pages we've printed in the last um, thirty days, but um, I'm sure Carl will see that starting to go down soon, um, just for the fact that that um, paperless folder is having a massive um, benefit to the whole team and people can see it instantly, they can add to it instantly, um, it can be updated and, and current the whole time, um, whereas there's been lots of problems in the past with people looking at wrong plans and, and making decisions on wrong plans and that sort of thing, so um, massive, massive improvement from that side. Mm. And do you find that um, has, has the communication between different departments uh, enhanced? Since yeah, and it's also... Um, it's also solidified um, how the communication works a little bit because if you're all at home in separate places, you can't just turn around and ask someone something um, or find out how to do something. So um, the, the pathways of communication have sort of have cleared up a lot. And so certain people have stood up and, and taken it upon themselves to, to sort of um, take on more of a responsibility. Other people uh, have sort of um, slipped into their, their zone. And so it's actually been quite a um, cool process to see how people have changed um, during that period as well. Um, but but a lot of the guys were saying, wow, this is like, I feel more connected in lockdown than I did at work, which was like a bit of a double-sided, um, you know, or a bit of a um, double, double, double-edged double sword in some regards, because it's, well, they're, they're sitting at home by themselves, but they're feeling more connected as a company when usually they're all in one room and all, all talking away. And so, um, we've we've analysed that a little bit and taken the good things out of it and sort of twisted things a little bit, changed things a little bit to try and um, mitigate some of the the negative um, sides that were happening before that we didn't even really realise. So um, definitely, I think keeping your eyes open and your ears open and just um, being open to um, taking on different ways of doing things or different ways of looking at things and challenging yourself as well as to is this the right way, is this the best way? Um, that's definitely been an advantage. From, from this whole experience as well. And speaking of change, uh, because you guys were doing a lot of uh, Zoom calls with potential clients, has that continued post lockdown? Yeah, yeah there's been instances where um, when we came out of the first lockdown, um, we deal a lot with sort of like young professional families where the husband and wife might both be at work and the kids are at a daycare and things like that. Um, and so for them to come into the showroom midweek and confirm their colors or go through detail, can be quite tricky in some some situations. So um, the number of lunchtime Zoom meetings that happened on the back of the lockdown like went through the roof, and people were um, quite quite open to the idea of um, both meeting up on their lunch break on their phone um, with the designer and just going through some bits to to get things um, nailed and a bit clearer. And and it worked for everyone. Um, we also had um, one of the promotions we ran um, earlier a couple of months ago was a free kitchen promotion. Um, where anybody who puts a deposit down in that month goes into the draw to win um, their, their kitchen back. And so um, we usually, well, we run, we run it yearly um, and we usually have everybody having to come back to the Mount Wellington store. Um, but we had a lot more people um, in that draw than we've ever had. Um, and one of the team said, oh, why don't we do like a live streaming thing from all the showrooms? And it was about a month before the actual date. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. And that date came around really, really fast. And I remember um, on the Monday before the Friday, um, having the holding the draw, thinking, wow, this could go really badly wrong. So um, sort of enlisted a bit of help with um, some of the, the technical um, people from companies that we deal with and their technical side. And um, sort of it all, it all seemed pretty obvious and pretty simple. And we, we ran it on that Friday. And we had sort of 80 people in, in each showroom. Um, and it was actually a blessing in disguise because... If we'd had uh, 140 people in Mount Wellington, um, the amount of rain that came down on that Friday night um, would have been a disaster. No one, not, not that many people could have fit into the showroom. And so we'd have people outside and the downpour and all these sort of things. Um, I remember doing the draw and thinking, I'm so glad that everyone's spread across Auckland, um, let alone the amount of traffic it would have caused on a Friday afternoon um, trying, to, trying to get to Mount Wellington. But um, yeah, so we've definitely taken things on board and um, also, people, uh, I think, feel a bit more willing to, to give ideas now. Um, they had a chance on Zoom. Some of the people in a meeting room 
that might not put their voice forward um, were more than happy to do so on a Zoom call, which was quite cool. Um, and that's then translated into now coming back into the sales meetings and the, the, um, the company meetings. They're, they're more prepared to put their ideas forward um, because those ideas they put forward in the Zoom meetings were awesome ideas and some of them have been implemented already. So um, yeah, definitely some cool things. Oh, that is just brilliant. So speaking of firsts, um, so I joined the Ice House just over two and a half years ago. And uh, the first program, uh, owner manager program uh, cohort I met was your one, Carl. So I'm just gonna share something with you guys. Um, Carl, if you could maybe sum up after a few seconds, uh, sum up what this photo means to you. Um, yeah, it's that look, they were an amazing group of guy or people. Um, it's, um, you know, doing, going through, through that with this group of people was incredible. Um, they're, they're, yeah, one of the fears that I had is, is that, um, is that you would go into something like the Ivy Management Program uh, with 20 odd other people, you know, and, and out of that 20, you know, you're going to have half a dozen that are, um, for a better word, you know, to kids and, and others that are, not sharing and all that sort of stuff. Literally, there is not one person that makes that lot that, that wasn't really on the same wavelength, that, um, that didn't share, didn't have good fun. Um, yeah, we had some late nights as well, but a lot of fun, a lot of laughs, learned a lot about other industries and other businesses. Um, and yeah, and it was, yeah, that photo just uh, just reminds me of, uh, of the, rest, that, the fun, the group that we had, and it, yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. So, uh, Carl, why did you join the owner manager program? Um, so specifically, what, it, what actually happened is Greg, um, as Greg mentioned, he came into the business quite early in the piece, or after a year or so um, of, of me running it. One of the issues that I had at that stage is that um, is that we were, or I, I was led to believe, or I led myself to believe, that the only way we could sell a kitchen was to have top kitchen designers. Um, and that they would, as long as they designed the right kitchen and a good kitchen for the customer, then we would get sales. And um, so I employed kitchen designers, um, and I'm not saying this against kitchen designers, but really and my frustration was that the conversion rates and things like that, I just couldn't change. I, couldn't, I wasn't getting anywhere with them, and the only way to grow the company was going to be tipping more and more money into more and more leads, um, but but just not being able to increase the conversion rate. So I knew there was something wrong, and um, and and Greg had um, had some experience in marketing, um, and had done um, at University of Auckland um, Bachelor of Commerce. And so I spoke to Greg, and, and so when he came back in, I said, "Look, really, what I want you to do is just have a look at the sales situation. Now just get involved in the sales team, have a look. But before you go out and sell or do anything." Um, do up a marketing plan and what have you. And before long, Greg was going down and meeting customers in the, in the showroom and asking questions and, and really having a look at it. And I think quite quickly understood some of the reasons why our conversion rate wasn't, wasn't increasing and, and we just weren't making headway. So, um, and so Greg, in the end, put together a sales process, documented sales process, um, which really required, to be perfectly honest, people who had a sales background that we could teach the design side of it, as opposed to a designer that we just couldn't teach the sales side of it. The, you know, the two just didn't marry up. Um, and from that point on, once we'd put that whole process together um, and documented it, and then we actually employed um, somebody who had been selling um, some stationery, um, pens and papers and whatever, um, Put him, gave him some training, um, put him out in front of customers, and all of a sudden his sales and his conversion rates were where we were expecting that anything to do. Because we knew we were making a really good product at a at a competitive rate, um, and and so and all of a sudden the designers started looking like, oh, okay, well, the guy from the stationery shop selling kitchens. Um, and of course, they were quite negative about the fact that they couldn't design kitchens, but but we had the backup. That's when we put in place backup in the technical part of it, so that so that they could um, make sure that his designs were right. And so that worked. And Greg had put all that together. We then started employing um, well, a police, a couple of police officers, in actual fact, to sell kitchens, and and that worked really well because they 
didn't mind asking the questions that needed to be asked in the beginning, rather than waste all of the time designing some beautiful thing that the customer was never, ever going to be able to pay for. Um, and so, so Greg then became the sales manager of the company um, and, and the company grew and grew and grew. And then um, unfortunately I had a bit of an accident um, going back four years ago now um, and injured my back and I had to have some spinal surgery. I had to have a fusion operation done. And so I literally had to go along to Greg and say, hey, here's the reins. I'm gonna be away for three months. Um, it's all yours, good luck um, and I'll see you later. And that's literally what happened. And it was also on the back of a few changes that we'd made. So it was a, it was a, a full on time. Um, and all that went really well. And during that period, we were just finishing off a big apartment building and there was a lot, there was a lot to dump on the shoulders. But during that period, everything went really, really well. And so he had moved into my office, which was fine. I was all right with that. But when I came back, I moved into a little spare office. And, um, and literally the day that I sort of came back, um, there was some staff come and ask me questions as they used to. And I guess I was one of these, because I'd started the business, I was the one, the go-to to find out what do I do here? What, what, what happens here and all the rest of it. And because I was back there, then, then it naturally the staff came and saw me. And so I just, without thinking, gave them the answer. And then a couple of days into it, Greg came into my office and he said, did you just tell so-and-so such and such? I said, yeah, why? And he said, oh, for God's sake. I've just told them, or I've told them last week that we can't do it this way. We've got to be, oh shit, okay, all right. Well, this is going to be a problem, isn't it? So, um, so I started looking at, a way, at what I could do because I had to then, then really reinvent myself in the business because Greg was doing a great job as being general manager. Um, and so the Ice House course was one that came to me um, for two reasons, really. One was, one was that I could look at the business and plan it around the move. Um, and when I say the move, the move of me out of being general manager and Greg sitting, sitting in my um, in my chair, um, but also succession planning because of, because of the family side of the business, and that was another bit of a concern that you know, as the business is growing and its and its value is growing, everything else, um, and there's family members involved in it. What was a succession plan? So that's the reason why I went to um, the owner manager program. Um, but I just saw it as a great opportunity to be able to get away from the business um, and stay out away from the business while it was happening. I thought it was great. Um, so that's what we did. Um, and literally, probably I came back from there with, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think from that time on, everybody knows in the business uh, who, who they go to now, who, who's in charge of the day they're running. Um, they still like to see me and I still like to see them, but they now work, you know, the staff are working for Greg, the, the, the suppliers know that Greg's the one that makes the decisions um, and all of that. So, and that was around our plan. We put together a, a plan for, for a, a two, three and five year plan that we're working towards. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been good. Mm. Mm. So Greg, you can add on to this. Um, so Cal was away doing this program, well, not, not literally away for five months, but three days a month for five months. Did you notice a difference in those five months? Um, yeah, so, so I guess during the, during the program, um, he would sort of come to me after he'd had his sort of sessions of working with the team and be like, oh, I've got this amazing idea. And then sort of the, the, the next lot of um, sort of time that he had spent with the team, it'd be, I've got this other amazing idea. And so straight away, there was this like, there was this not reborn energy because he's always um, been very enthusiastic about things. And, um, but it was sort of like he'd come to life in terms of strategy and, and, and sort of, I guess, the fire that he had when he started the company was like being re reborn just about, which was, which was really cool. Um, and so during the process, there was lots of like um, new ideas and things and things happening, which was exciting. Um, but I remember when he put together his um, presentation at the end that he had to um, sort of put to the, to the whole team and have it critiqued and all these sort of things. That's where I saw like a real um, structured understanding of like how to put ideas together to then make something actually happen rather than just coming with ideas sort of week to week. Um, and so that, that was, that was awesome. And so having um, the combination of, of Carl and I, where um, I'm looking after the day-to-day -day stuff and looking after making sure the departments have got what they need and everything's running properly. 
um, and then having him to be able to sit back and, and look at um, the company as a whole and like um, come to me with some strategic ideas on, on, on where the company goes. So I, I feel like that, that combination is working really, really well. Um, because for sure, day-to-day -day running of a company is, is hectic. And so to try and put another layer on top of that of, of trying to tease out ideas or look at different strategies um, can mean sometimes that one or the other um, sort of um, falls away as a result. And so having the combination of, of Carl and I both being able to do the parts that we need to do is, is working as a really cool partnership at the moment. Um, one of the other things I saw is um, we used to have our monthly meetings, but the monthly meetings would sort of change um, every every other every other month. So I'd be booked in for this time and it would change because something's come up and then it would change because of this or I had something or he had something. And um, I think doing the course has really given Carl some like structure of how things need to happen and, and given like an understanding of the importance of why um, strategy meetings and, and understanding a, a retrospective look and a forward look at how the business is going is why why that's so important and so um, those meetings happen really well now and they're, they're well structured and um, I can give good information Carl can feed back information so it's yeah it's working well as a partnership for sure. Oh that's brilliant and Carl um, how was your wife during those five months? Um, and I, she's probably happy to see me go away every now and again, to be honest. <laughs> she's, no, she's, uh, Kathy's, um, as, as always been, um, I always tell people if there's anybody I want to be in a, if I'm in a war in a trench, there's only one person I want sort of beside me and that's, that's Kathy and she, um, she'll just roll up her sleeve and, and get involved and do what she has to do and, um, yeah, she's, she's probably the go-to person for, or, uh, well, certainly as far as the family goes, um, you know, when when she's called on or needed for grandchildren or children or backing up or the business, um, she's there and available. So, and um, I think she was very keen on me doing the owner manager program. Um, yeah, just to just to it had been the company was eight years old then, when they put it, um, and it had been sort of head down, bum up, and and I hadn't had a lot of outside influence or a lot of, uh, I guess. A lot of um, you know people around me at that stage um, that I could bounce ideas off. So for her, it was a, it was an opportunity that she saw that I could take. Um, yeah, so yeah, she was certainly right behind it, and I think um, enjoyed to say me being away every now and again. Mm -hmm. I remember meeting you in Mount Wellington. I think you were you were actually my first alumni uh, meeting, and it right. was absolutely amazing. Uh, having that chat with you for an hour and I wrote down so many notes like pages of notes and then I remember you saying oh Greg come on in you know meet the ice house girl and, and that's when I met you Greg as well so that was that was over two years ago that's crazy isn't it yeah it's gone past so so quickly so mm. quickly hey so uh, we're, we're about to wrap up but I just wanted um, you guys you know if you have any advice to anyone that is watching this uh, this podcast any advice or any key things that they should be looking at in their business you know in this interesting environment yeah um, I think personally most for my side of it and 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 I'm only talking from really a business that um, probably hasn't that hasn't had the same effect as well certainly hasn't had the same effect as as uh, some businesses have through this through this whole COVID thing, and and you know, no blame of 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 the owners or the management team, but their their businesses have just been completely decimated. But from my side of it, I guess I guess for me, it's 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 about um it's about knowing your business really really well and being up to date with it. Like it's so nice when you when when as a financial side of it, you can actually put your finger on the pulse, bang on what it is. You know what's in the bank, what's coming in, what the overhead structure is, all of those sort of things, so that you can move quickly and you know exactly, I guess the sort of you know the, the circumstances and the runway that might be might be associated with those circumstances. So, the one thing is is saying that you know to to really be on your finger on the pulse with with that side of thing was very good. Um, and again, we are fortunate. We had a lot of work ahead. We've had some good years. So the company's in a very strong financial position, um, which, which which was great. You know, 
But the second one is, and this is where I sort of come from each time, is um, is to look at opportunities, you know, and 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 rather than rather, you know, it is what it is. We we the government says you you're in lockdown. Um, no point complaining about it. No point jumping up and down and getting on the radio shows and all that because it's not going to change it. Um, but there are opportunities, and I think there's opportunities for most businesses. You might have to look outside the box a little. You might have to. Um, look at what you do really, really well and see how you can adapt quickly to still do really, really well. Um, and, and take those opportunities that come along. Marketing cost opportunities through lockdown was unbelievable. We've literally, we've had a billboard that we haven't paid for since February and it's still sitting up now and we're now into September. And, they, and I literally haven't paid one cent for it because he hasn't been able to sell it and he just wants a skin on the, on the billboard. So it's sitting there. Um, those opportunities are there, branding, um, all of that sort of thing, so that when you do come through it, um, you, know, you come through with a little bit of a stronger brand or a stronger image. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, of course, you need to be, you, know, you need to watch the pennies and you need to, I think, move quickly where you do have to move quickly. Um, but also look for those opportunities that are there because there are opportunities for sure. Mm -hmm. I'd say um, the biggest thing for me is the mindset and it's the mindset of yourself and um, how that mindset um, rolls over to your team as well. And so just being aware of yourself um, in, in situations of stress or um, no sales or whatever it is and just, just being very aware of how you're portraying yourself to your team and thinking about how you want your team to be and then aligning your mindset of, of how you think you should be to, to help that happen as well. And so um, different people are going to um, go through things in different ways and being open and accepting of that, um, but then delivering a clear um, sort of measured approach to things and, and being very positive in a mindset. Um, easy to say when things are going well, um, much more difficult when things are testing and trying, but it's, it's usually the times where it's testing and trying where you actually find your A players and find sort of um, little gems um, hiding. So yeah, for sure be open to opportunities, but um, start with the mindset being right, I think is, is the number one thing for me. Um, absolutely brilliant advice and a great way to finish this podcast. Uh, thank you, Carl, and thank you, Greg, for your time. Uh, sorry, we went on a little bit uh, too long, but hey. That's, I, that's, that's actually, not unusual I, for Carl, let me tell you. <laughs> anytime that guy talks. Oh, I absolutely loved it. It's been an absolute pleasure um, learning a lot more about, about you two and, and, and how you both work. It looks like you guys, you know, you're, you're very much in sync. Um, and you know what each other is, is doing uh, at Kitchen Mania and, you know, may your success continue. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks Thank for you. the opportunity. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers, Nancy.